everyone. On behalf of the University of California, I'd like to thank you for tuning in today for the April 2020 edition of the UC Alumni Career Network. My name is Malika Marshall, and I'm a board certified physician in both internal medicine and pediatrics. And I currently, currently serve on staff at Harvard Medical School and practice at the Mass General Hospital, Chelsea Urgent Care Clinic, and their Revere Health Center. I also serve as the regular health reporter at WBZ, which is a CBS station in Boston. And of course, I am a very proud UCSF alum. I'm honored to be moderating, moderating today uh, this event that's focused on professional success in healthcare for mid career and beyond. You know, it's quite fortuitous that the organizers planned this as a virtual event long before the time of COVID. They must have had a premonition that most of us did not. But I'm thrilled that so many of you are able to join us this afternoon, and I wish you and your families good health and much happiness in these troubled times. You know, this program is part of a UC-wide effort to unite and support alumni across our 10 campuses. We aim to equip you with the information, insights, and connections necessary to launch or grow or expand your career. Throughout today's session, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions of our speaker by clicking on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I think a lot of us are used to Zoom now, or by emailing alumni at ucop.edu. That's alumni at ucop.edu. And we'll try to answer as many questions as possible during the event. Our discussion today will focus on professional success in healthcare with a particular focus on mid and later career professionals and the challenges and opportunities we face in our work. I am pleased to be joined by three inspiring UC alumni. First, we have Yama Akbari, who's a critical care neurologist and neuroscientist, an assistant professor of neurology and neurological surgery at UC Irvine, specializing in neurocritical care. Yama holds a BS in psychobiology from UCLA and a combined MD PhD from UC Irvine. Cherie Kreiner is passionate about reducing health inequity and decreasing the social determinants of health. And as nurse manager, she leads several surgical specialty departments at Kaiser Permanente. Cherie holds a Master of Science in Healthcare Leadership and Nursing from Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing at the University of California, Davis. And then we have Leah Lowe, who's a project manager at Kaiser Permanente in Southern California. Leah holds a bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley, a Master of Public Health, and a Master of Business Administration, both from UCLA. What amazing talents you all have. I'd like to thank Yama, Cherie, and Leah all for being part of today's panel. So we're just going to jump right in and we're going to start with our first question and we're going to start with Yama. And I'd like you to just explain a little bit about, you know, how you ended up, a little bit about your professional journey and how you ended up in the role you have now. Yama. Thank you, Dr. Marshall. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, as Dr. Marshall mentioned, I, uh, I'm an alumni. Um, I was actually born in Afghanistan. Uh, I came here as a, as a child um, and I grew up in Denver, Colorado. Uh, and uh, my family moved around a lot. I actually attended nine different schools uh, between first and 12th grade. I ended up graduating um, high school in, uh, in Anaheim in California. And then uh, basically that's where my interest uh, in the brain began. So I majored in psychobiology at UCLA and then pursued a, an MD-PhD program at UCI where I, my PhD was focused on uh, neurobiology. And then uh, my interest in the brain continued and, and I ended up doing a residency in uh, neurology at, at, at UCLA. And, and then um, at that point, my interest be, uh, uh, was more, mostly focused on uh, acute level care and I became, became very interested in critical care. So then I ended up uh, specializing in, in neurocritical care. So I basically, I, I did that uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins, a two-year critical care fellowship. And I've been on faculty at UCI uh, for the past several years, about almost eight years. Uh, and I wear multiple hats now. Um, uh, so I uh, split my time between clinical work in the neurointensive care unit. Uh, I run a research lab uh, focused on coma consciousness and cardiac arrest and resuscitation. I, I teach uh, uh, everybody from high school students to college uh, to medical students and residents and, and fellows. And then I do um, significant administrative and service work. And that's how I actually was invited here because I'm the co-president of the alumni chapter for the UCI School of Medicine. Um, uh, Morgan, one of our, our associate director for alumni relations invited me to this. 
Uh, and then um, I'm, uh, lately, I've also worn a, a, a new hat in the past year or two, uh, where I've, I've been uh, involved in inventorship and development of medical devices. So I wear a few different hats, and, and essentially, my passion is has been directed towards the brain and trying to help the brain. Um, and, uh, and most recently, we've gotten uh, uh, somewhat intertwined with, with COVID, trying to uh, make a difference in that as, as well. Thank you very much for, the, for allowing me to introduce myself. I'm glad you brought up COVID, Yama, because I think it would be silly of us not to address the elephant in the room. And you've really been on the front lines dealing with people with COVID, specifically in the neuro ICU or just a, a general ICU. Just tell us briefly what you've been doing these past few weeks. Yeah, so um, we're um, so luckily California has flattened the curve a lot. Um, we, we've been in line to be the third ICU uh, to to get patients, uh, but we we did have we've had at least one um, uh, definitive positive patient that that uh, we diagnosed last week when I was covering uh, the ICU, and then we've had other patients that were suspected ones, including one who who passed away from ARDS last week that I had high suspicion was going to be checked again on autopsy. Uh, but it's 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 quite an experience. I I never thought I'd be seeing something like this in the medical field. It's it's made us extremely humble. Uh, as an intensive care doctor, you know we have to deal with with the ventilators and everything ourselves in in our unit. And um, uh, without a doubt, uh, it, it's a COVID is a is a different beast, and it's rewriting textbooks and uh, really making us scratch our heads. Uh, we need as much help as we can from everybody in the world to try to conquer this uh, this. Uh, unbelievable uh, uh, disease. Thank you, Yama. Well, this is a great way to segue to Cherie, who also has been working on the front lines. Maybe you two can just give us an idea of how you ended up in your position and how COVID has affected your job these past few weeks. Um, absolutely. I am a registered nurse. I'm a nurse manager uh, for Kaiser, and I and board certified in ambulatory care. Um, and that ties in with my passion of helping patients where they are um, in the community, um, having patients to thrive and uh, focus on preventative medicine, um, in addition to the specialty care that we provide in surgical specialties. Um, born and raised in Oakland, California, um, to a wonderful uh, family that uh, really focused on, my mom was first generation to go to college. So, um, and I'm her child as the second uh, person in our family. So I found my passion for um, healthcare and nursing. Like I met a wonderful nurse that uh, inspired me to think at that moment, that's what I wanted to do to be able to help people. Um, and along my career, uh, I, did multiple leadership roles. Um, my specialties have in surgical specialty have been head and neck surgery, neurosurgery, spine. Um, and I currently reside as the vice president of the Capital City Black Nurses Association, um, which is our local chapter of the National Black Nurses Association. So I'm able to bridge the work that I do from the bedside to the boardroom out to the community. Um, just inspiring nurses were the largest part of the healthcare sector. Um, so empowering nurses to be the change that we want to see and being uh, partners with our physicians and our advanced practice practitioners and other technicians to really help patients where they are to thrive and um, to really work on some of the social determinants of health. So I've been able to toggle a little bit of everything in my um, career so currently, um, I'm in a fortunate position to lead the charge here at Kaiser to provide safety for not only our um, staff, providers, and our patients. Um, and we are definitely in a position um, with the curve being flattened that you know we couldn't imagine. I've talked to colleagues across the country, and um, we're definitely fortunate to be as prepared as we are and to have the resources that we have. Um, and as an advocate for nurses that I serve in my board position, um, we also are providing mental health resources, um, access to PPE, and additional support for the nurses that are working every day. So I'm able to put on both hats and help across uh, the spectrum. So I'm, I feel very fortunate to be in that um, position and there's, there's nothing else I, I'd rather do. I'm, not, I'm muted, sorry. Um, she's wearing her UC Davis pride, which she got a little flack for <laughs> at, at <Yeah>. Kaiser, <laughs> right? 
Yes. No, um, and I, I'm sorry. I left out the most. I left out the most important part. I um, finished the master's of leadership in healthcare nursing um, in 2018 at the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. Um, it is a great, great um, semi-new uh, division of UC that is just pumping out change agents like crazy, and we are um, fired up and ready to serve. And I am very proud to be UC alum. That's great. Okay, next we're going to hear from Leah. Leah, tell us a little bit about sort of how you arrived where you are today in front of that beautiful backdrop. <laughs> well, first of all, I would like to just acknowledge what an unprecedented time this is and thank everyone, um, our panelists, our moderator, everyone who put this together, but also the folks that are on the phone. You know, every little thing we do uh, contribute to the safety and health and well-being of our healthcare providers. So washing your hands, staying at home, volunteering, serving on the front lines, it, each of us has a role. Thank you very much for everybody, um, all of their efforts. So um, my current life is uh, that I am, I've rolled out the curbside testing for Kaiser West LA, um, which has been a, an incredible learning experience. Um, but a bit about my background. So I was a teen parent. I had my son two weeks after I graduated high school. Um, at the same time, my sister was diagnosed with cancer. She had three young boys and was given three months to live and lived for four years, um, thanks 100% to UC Davis and UCSF. She received her care there. Um, and so I learned a lot very young about dealing with the healthcare system, both as a young mom and my son required a special treatment when he was younger. Um, and also just because of the interactions with my sister and seeing how uh, she moved through the healthcare system. So I actually stayed home for the first two years and went to a junior college um, and then transferred to UC Berkeley, which is really where I found my love of research. I worked for three years at the Office of Veterans Affairs um, and I'm so thankful to have contributed to the men and women who served our country. Um, and from there, I realized while I love research, I also want to have part of my career built on action. And so I went back to get my first master's degree, my master's of public health from Fielding School at UCLA, um, and was really able to pursue my dedication to repro reproductive health. Uh, I in, uh, did my internship in Guatemala, actually with Population Council. Um, and when I came back and graduated, I moved back up to the Bay Area and worked for 10 years for UC San Francisco in teen pregnancy prevention and access to care. Um, and then uh, bouncing back down to LA, I've been here about five years um, and knew I wanted to work for Kaiser Permanente. They had been uh, an outstanding resource for me as a young mom. Um, and I knew I wanted to support that mission. I'm very happy to have worked for the UC system and for Kaiser because the mission is so critical to um, carrying out your work, right? Um, so I've been with Kaiser for five years as of last week. I started out by running a virtual pulmonary rehabilitation program out of our research and evaluation department. And then a couple years ago, um, knew that I wanted to move into a more operational position. When I shopped my resume around, people said, you know, it's cute that you've published things, but like you're, if you're going into operations, we need to see more of that on your resume. So I actually made a lateral move um, and am working at a health, uh, a medical center now and went back to school to get my uh, MBA at UCLA Anderson. Excellent. Thank you, Leah. So I think this is a good time to sort of talk about how, you know, we all have these great careers, which I'm sure we love, but I know for me, there were bumps along the road, and I'm sure there have been bumps along the road for you guys as well. Let's start with Cherie, and um, if you could just tell us some of the challenges that you've faced over the years um, in getting where you are today. Um, I will tell you that um, one of the biggest challenges um, in nurse leadership is really figuring out early on to partner with your physician and non um, healthcare partners. Um, and uh, once I figured that out, my career has been really great because, um, as uh, Dr. Gawande would say, healthcare is a pit crew, right? We, every, it takes everyone's part um, to get the car back on the road as quickly as possible. And so, what um, my hardest challenge has now become my greatest joy. I love working with my physician partners 
and our administrators and other leaders to solve problems with all stakeholders at the table. And um, one of the things I actually love about UC Davis and I um, facilitate many classes now and, um, and I'm on several panels is the, um, you know, the multidisciplinary approach. Um, I just facilitated a course where we had um, medical students, nurse practitioner students, PA students, and um, master's entry level nurses all learning about um, epidemiology and health disparities and all those things together. So bringing that environment into the educational space um, was really forward thinking and that's really where we are. Um, the other piece that I focused on in my career is mentorship. Uh, where I grew up, there weren't a lot of people that looked like me uh, that worked in the healthcare field or that attended college or knew how to navigate the process. So I spent a lot of my time also um, mentoring and volunteering at um, K through 12 schools. I'm just encouraging little minds to think outside of what they may see every day um, and introduce them to uh, healthcare, whether they want to be a nurse or they want to be a neurosurgeon. I want to have uh, them have a role model and access to understanding the importance of that and also their influence in their community. So um, that has been the greatest part of my career. The greatest challenge has also been the most rewarding because um, it really takes a village, right? It takes all of us to provide excellent care that is safe, that is of high quality, that looks beyond the health system and out in the community. So I am very uh, fortunate to have been able to build a network of bridging all of those pieces um, together. And so, uh, you know, beyond my role at the hospital, I'm also on the leadership board for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, um, raising necessary funds for uh, research and patient support, in addition to um, my nursing professional um, organizations where I'm helping other um, professionals advance in their career and learn new skills. Um, and it really takes being in all of these different avenues and bridging that together to provide um, the best uh, patient care environment, as well as a professional environment. Um, we are really pushing nurses to um, obtain their um, higher education, um, their DMP, PhDs. There's a lot of work going on. Um, I've been able to publish a couple of items and that has all come together to empower me to really make change. So. Um, I would say collaboration and um, communication and community. Oh, wow, the three C's. I'm glad yeah. you mentioned uh, <laughs> collaboration um, because I think that's an important lesson for everyone to learn and sometimes we have to learn it the hard way. But, um, you know, I work in an urgent care and we're a very small unit. So the nurses and the doctors and the MAs and the PAs and the nurse practitioners, I mean, and the front desk staff, we all really have to get along. And there have been some times when we haven't as well. But I think you know, coronavirus has definitely brought us together and made us much more cohesive and much more cooperative with one another. So an important, an important theme. Um, Leah, you talked about your being a, a teenage mom mm -hmm. and the challenges that that faced. Were there any other challenges that you noticed or was that sort of the greatest one to overcome to be where you are today? Um, I actually think it was my biggest asset. I, I think of the challenges that I faced and um, being able to be a mom who was young, being able to be someone who was involved in the, in the healthcare system to such a deep level um, when I was young really shaped so much of, of the way that I move forward. I think the biggest lesson I've learned um, is, is what got me here won't get me there, right? So I may have been able to raise a young son, but that doesn't mean I'm going to be able to raise a teenager. I may have been able to, you know, work at the VA, but maybe that doesn't mean I'm, I'm right for the School of Public Health. So I think that always challenging uh, myself to broaden my perspective uh, has really been one of the most uh, critical pieces for me. I think that when you are able to translate information up and downstream to many different types of audiences, um, that's really when you are um, able to make a bigger impact you are going to need to have a very different vocabulary, for example, when you're presenting to physicians and then when you're turning around and talking with parents. Um, this is particularly true in reproductive health, right? Um, where things are often um, 
turn political. Um, and when you look at the heart of things, everybody wants children to grow up to be strong and healthy and have great relationships. So how do you move forward with that? We all start at the same core, let's move forward. And then to go back to what got you here won't get you there, that means you have to keep challenging yourself to broaden your perspective and also to broaden your perspective as it relates to those that you're, that you're working with. Thank you, Leah. Yama, you said you were from Afghanistan, is that correct? That's correct. How old were you when you came over? I was, I was five years old. Um, so you were young. Yeah. Did that present so, certain challenges or did you have bigger challenges that you confronted? No, I, that, well, uh, yeah, I think it ties into some of the challenges the, that I've faced and uh, kind of the biggest challenge that I eventually faced. But essentially, we, we, had, um, we had a lot of financial problems. And so I ended up attending, I grew up in inner, inner city Denver, Colorado. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it was uh, not knowing, you know, having the, the obstacles of any immigrant in here is, is certainly obvious to many, many people uh, who are immigrants. Um, but, uh, you know, overcoming a lot of the financial issues, that, you know, I had to get a job uh, from fifth grade on. I had a job to help my parents out um, in Denver. That, that included, sh you know, shoveling snow, raking the leaves and you know, mowing the lawns and things like that. Um, and then, um, you know, that went on. And uh, when I was in college, you know, I was, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Actually, I, I liked medicine. I loved research. And then I eventually ended up applying to an MD PhD program. Um, mostly because I just loved both of the fields of, of healthcare and research. Um, and then when I ended up wanting to get a job after my, my training, after my, my fellowship, I was left with a, a, a similar sort of decision, whether, which was whether to go into private practice um, and, uh, or, or, or you know, go into academics and, and have a, have, do what I really like to do, which was run a research lab that's, that's devoted to, to something that I, I have had a lot of passion for. And with that comes, you know, a, um, a balance, a trade-off, because, um, uh, you, know, you know, private practice is, is you know, more lucrative and whatnot. Um, and I, and I, it was a big uh, challenge uh, that, that I faced at the time. And I think one of the things I learned was I, I followed my, my, my passion. I ended up becoming, an, you know, an academic um, neurointensive care doctor. Um, I, I was able to build a research lab uh, um, and, uh, you know, eventually have it NIH uh, funded. Um, uh, and it was, it's, it's, it's not easy, uh, but, but, I, but as uh, Leah pointed out very, very well, very eloquently, I think a lot of times the greatest challenges are our greatest assets. And um, one thing in the neuro ICU that I've learned uh, uh, more recently over the past few years that sort of goes back to, the, to this biggest challenge, in my opinion, that I've faced um, is that there's no week that I goes by without me signing a death certificate. Um, and so there's a lot of end of life uh, care, you know, we're either coding somebody, you know, helping them overcome uh, a major challenge or we're letting them pass away with dignity. Um, and um, what I've learned, and that's how my research lab has actually become focused on coma and consciousness and cardiac arrest and death. And so I tried to intertwine all of these interests, both, both in my clinical setting and the research setting. And what I've learned really is that, um, you know, life is short and you, you know, we have to really follow our passions. Um, and sometimes when we make uh, uh, choosing a career, we have to, we have to, uh, um, you know, we have to make sacrifices. And sometimes that may mean uh, going for the, for the position that may have a slightly less salary, for example, or, or um, uh, going for the career that may be more busy, that may, may take us away from our kids uh, or our family sometimes. But I think that in the, in the grand scheme of things, uh, that, that is something, in my opinion, well worth it. Because at the end of the day, uh, when, when we're on our deathbed, when we look back, we want to really feel proud of something we did for not just ourselves or our family, but, but the whole world. Um, and that goes way beyond things like, you know, how much money did, did we make or, or, or things. And so happiness comes from within. And, and I think that our challenges a lot of times provide, uh, become our, our greatest assets in life that build resilience. Very well said. And a great way to segue, segue into our next question. <coughs> um, I know I look so young, but I've been out of school for a very long time long time and I remember when I was in residency and shortly thereafter they would have sessions available for residents or um, 
new physicians on work-life balance. And they were always intended just for women, right? These were like things where women could come and talk about what it's like to be a doctor and have kids. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but times have changed. And, uh, you know, men and women are both playing greater roles at home and both trying to strike work-life balance. Um, and so I'd like to know, um, you know, Yama and I were talking about how hard it is to try to protect our families from getting sick when um, we're seeing patients with COVID, which is true for all the panelists, and I'm sure many of you out there. Um, tell us a little bit about what, and I'm starting with Leah this time. Tell us a little bit about what it's, um, what it's like to try to balance life, because everybody is doing so many things. Like, what is it like to try to actually get together with friends and spend time with family while you're trying to do so much at work? I think that Yama could, uh, you know, said it best. Uh, when we are at the end of our life and we look back, we're going to know if we've accomplished the things that were important or not. And taking that into consideration now is, especially in light of everything that's happening with COVID, is uh, is critical. So, you know, when I think about what we're dealing with right now, I I don't know that work life balance is possible. But what I do want to say is uh, I have a good friend who reminds me, be gentle with yourself. And I'd like to add to that and be forgiving of others. So right now may not be the time to pursue work-life balance. Don't worry, there will be time in the future. Um, when I think about how I've been able to get to this point, I think about the times that I had to take a step back and really identify whether I was pursuing the things that were most important to me. Um, for many of us, that starts with family, and that is more important than our careers. Um, but the second piece for me really was to have a job that I loved um, that also allowed me to be there for my son and the rest of my family. Um, and so by having a job that I loved, I was less concerned about the paycheck. Um, because I was fulfilled, I was happy to go to work every day. Um, and then when we don't have a job that we love, we need to be thinking about, can we turn it into something we love? Um, I do love my current job, but I also wanted to add a little um, of the, the mentoring piece that I, that I really appreciate. So I started a program with two local universities, including UCLA, um, for a partnership to bring on uh, interns. And hopefully, really, the, the point of that is not only the experience that they're build, they're building, but also to build our own internal pipeline, right? So to think through who are the people that we want to see in leadership roles. Um, and that does bring me great joy. It brings me um, some balance. The other thing I have to say is just a very practical piece of advice. When I started my MBA, I asked people, how do you do it? You know, how do you work full time and do an MBA full time? And someone gave me advice, which at the moment I thought was quite devastating. And I have to say it was, it was just about the best advice I had received. And it was to go on a goodbye tour. So it was to spend the summer before I started school visiting the friends that I knew I would not be able to dedicate time to in the same way I had been. And that saved those relationships. I graduated this June, I came back and everybody was, was ready for me. Whereas if I had not been cognizant of the fact and acknowledged that I wouldn't be able to be there in the same way, um, I think that, that those relationships would have, would have taken a hit. And I needed that as soon as I graduated, I needed all that support. I needed them to say, keep going, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to make this happen. Yama, how about you? Um, yeah, so I, um, I, I think this is a this is a, is a very good question that I'm sure a lot of people um, are uh, the participants here are wondering about. Um, in in my case, um, you know, I've, I I take care of a lot of people. Uh, so I have my my three kid, my wife and three kids. My father in law lives with us, um, and so which is as Dr. Marshall was was saying, we we have to be careful to protect our family, uh, uh, you know, from this, and so. Um, like Dr. Marshall, I'm I'm actually on social isolation. I'm I'm in my room wearing a mask when I whenever I go out. I keep my distance from my kids and my my elderly father-in-law. That I think that's important to protect him. I also happen to I have to take care of my, my my own elderly parents who live about three miles away in a small little apartment. So this is this provides a big challenge. You know, we have multiple jobs. We're working way over 40 hours a week. You know, I, we're talking 80 hours a week. You know, uh, uh, for, for me personally, I mean, uh, it's it's uh, it's become normal. 
uh, that's not, I'm not saying that's, that's, a, that's a good thing, but sometimes we have to do what we got to do. Uh, but the, some of the things I do personally to try to establish a balance between uh, work and life, number one, um, I, I strongly recommend meditating. Uh, I, I meditate every single day. I think this is important because it lives us, it, it teaches us to live in the moment um, and not worry about the future. That's, that's really important. And, and going back to what I said earlier, you know, having, having seen a lot of people, uh, you know, at the end of their lives, uh, uh, the, holding their hands and, and grieving with family members, it's important to live in the moment because you don't, we don't know whether, you know, coronavirus is going to get us or whether we're going to have a car accident the next minute. Right. And so we just have to live in the moment. And I think, uh, finding a, a, a method, whether it's meditation or something else, to, to live in the moment and be appreciative of, of everything around us is very critical. Uh, I, I think exercise is wonderful. So I, every, every morning I, I make it, uh, you know, it's, I never miss it. Uh, 20 minutes of exercise. I get up, first thing I do, 20 minutes of exercise. A anybody can, can afford 15, 20 minutes or, 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 you know, 25 minutes, whatever it is. But anything, 10 minutes is better than nothing. And it just to cl cl clear our minds. And then, um, and then lastly, I, I try to seek inspiration from, from within myself and my surroundings on a day-to-day -day basis. If I have an experience with a patient, with my students, with my neighbors, whatever it is, I, I try to let it absorb within me. And, and this goes back to another sort of hallmark uh, you know, thing that I've learned, um, and which is to not run away from, from emotion. I think it's important to, to experience it. And if that means grieving at times, you have to experience it. If that means joyous times, experience it. And I think that that's what it means. Every kind of experience we have in our life, we have to, when, that, when, when I'm hugging my kids, I experience it. And just living every moment, giving it 110%, whether it's positive, negative, experiencing something is far better than not experiencing it. And I think that, that I think to me is, is really helps, um, you know, prevent burnout and, and maintain that balance between work and life. Okay, so we've got goodbye tours. We've got living in the moment. Cherie, what do you have for us? I will say that um, it is definitely meditation. I, I wholeheartedly agree that um, being mindful and intentional about what we're doing um, definitely impacts our perception of reality. And so just having that moment to reset your intentions, be mindful and meditate. It can be one minute. Um, it may be that you set your intentions for providing the best possible care in the safest way for every person that you can today. Um, and reframing all of the um, concern and a nervousness that everyone's having with affirmations um, and being intentional. The other part is work life. Um, I always joke that it's work life imbalance. Um, what I've realized is that you are always on and sometimes you are sacrificing time with your loved ones and friends. Um, or I always joke that I just want to read a really bad book that has nothing to do with learning. <laughs> um, but what I've, um, what I've done and found most valuable is to always walk the walk. So I start my staff meetings with mindfulness and meditation. We'll do a one minute meditation. Um, I implement um, time for people to, um, we start every meeting um, with sharing of a caring moment or acknowledging someone on the team that did something. Just time to attune to each other as humans, like at the end of the day, um, seeing each other as a person is very important because we are here long hours. We are being asked to do more than maybe we would do um, normally and it's easy to take that um, home. So I would suggest um, you know, intertwining some of those things in your regular day and role modeling for um, your staff if you're in a leadership position or even your colleagues to take that moment. It just takes a moment. Literally one minute of meditation can slow your heart rate and relax your shoulders and prepare you for um, the day. And then the other thing I would say is um, writing things down. Um, there's been studies on um, when people actually write things down, there's a higher chance of them completing said task. So um, maybe you write in the time with your uh, child where it's something really special to them that they don't want you to forget so that you protect that time. So being intentional about um, scheduling um, things in your life as well as the things that you would do at work to make sure that you're stopping and pausing to do those things. Um, and then lastly, I will say, 
uh, one of my uh, mentors gave me the analogy of juggling balls that, um, you know, your health is a glass ball. Your, um, some relationships are a glass ball, but school, work, uh, material things are all rubber balls. Like they can drop, but you can bounce back. But taking care of those glass balls when you're juggling everything should be your top priority. You guys are so good. I've learned so much information. And I have to say that I kind of miss the California stuff you guys do out there. I've been back in Massachusetts for 25 plus years. I can tell you there's a lot less meditation going out here, going on here in Massachusetts than in California. So I'll have to come back for a visit so I can get back into the meditation. But I love all of those, all of those pieces of advice, the balls, the exercise, the meditation, um, living in the moment. Uh, it's all, all great advice. Okay, Cherie, do not mute yourself yet because we're going to turn to some questions and please keep the questions coming. But we do have our first question from the audience. This is a question from Lauren who says she's also a nurse and sometimes feels like career advancement is based on seniority, not necessarily on performance and goals. What advice, Cherie, would you give to a younger nurse learning to advance in project leadership or management? Right. Um, I would say to find what you're really passionate about um, and what your strengths are and to um, find a mentor that does what you think you want to do um, or may want to do and learn more about their pathway and their process. Um, and I find that the, the more you find out information about everyone else's journey to that same position, then you can take bits and pieces to make it your own. So I would say find someone that does that current um, role. And then I would also strongly encourage um, networking and also participation in your professional organizations in either your specialty or there's nursing organizations like the American Nurses um, Association um, to um, network and build your social capital so that you know more people and have more influence. And, um, and I would also suggest um, diving in to uh, projects and research and things that you're passionate about. You can become a content expert and uh, people like to find people with solutions because we have a lot of problems. So you can be a solution and um, that ups your social capital. People will say, oh, this person knows how to solve something, especially if you're working at the bedside you already are a content expert and may have valuable information um, that can really make change that's necessary. So I would say kind of spread your wings. And then I, I hope our information is available um, as far as contacting us after this, because anyone can reach out individually. I'd be happy to talk. Great. I'm sure we can make that available to everyone. Thank you, Cherie. Um, Leah, you're up next. We have a question from Arna who asks, how will public health be affected by coronavirus and what may the future of healthcare look like from your perspective? I want us all to take into consideration that right now is the time to build the brand of public health. We turn to trusted sources such as the CDC for Kaiser. It's, you know, we, we encourage people to go to the Kaiser website. Right now is the time to put in the work so that in three years, in five years, in 10 years, when we have um, other issues that come up that are health related, people think first of turning to reliable sources instead of Facebook and Instagram, right? So right now is, is definitely the time to, to put in the, the effort for that. Um, I think that we'll learn a lot, um, not only about supply chain as it relates to um, just the general world, but also within healthcare. Um, and I think that right now is a time for real opportunity. So thinking through what works, what doesn't work. Most of us have transitioned to predominantly telephone or video visits. Um, so what works, what doesn't work? When we are able to come back into and have office visits, what should be kept online? Um, and when are people more satisfied with that care? So I think that um, looking for the opportunities right now, I don't know that we, we know all of them, but I, I encourage people to also look beyond healthcare and think through how healthcare can inform other industries. We often hear that healthcare is a broken system, it needs to be fixed. Well, you know what? We have a lot of things going really well for us that we should import or export to other industries. So I think it's that, that sharing of knowledge right now. I mean, to me, 
think through like, how are we going to, when we open up those schools, how on earth are we going to keep kids hands clean? How are we going to, you know, make all of this happen so that we can do that kind of tap dance back out into society once restrictions are lessened? Um, so I, I would just say, you know, reach out. I'm happy to chat, but I love hearing about new ideas and thinking through um, what could possibly change. I'm very curious to see what will remain sticky. Um, will we continue on with all of these video visits? How will uh, we be able to be reimbursed right now? Many of us switch to those telephone and video visits with no promise of reimbursement, but we did it because it's the right thing to ensure the quality of care that we're expected to deliver. I think Cherie had mentioned actually before we started the session that trying to get some of the physicians to do the virtual um, virtual visits was very difficult, but since coronavirus is here, almost everybody's doing it. So yeah, there are going to be some positive things that come out of it and things, you know, new skills that we're all building. Um, Yama, I want to ask you a question. For someone who's interested in academic medicine, do you have any advice that you could offer on how to achieve that? Um, sure. Uh, so academic medicine is uh, it's a, it's a very wide field, and I think it's going to become wider with the coronavirus. So I actually think that the opportunities are probably going to going to increase. Uh, typically, in the UC system, for example, there are different tracks of of uh, opportunity for academic medicine. And I'll just be be brief, but um, I can say that there are the the straight clinical tracks. So, for example, becoming a in a, a, a professor of a, a what's, called, what's called a health science uh, track series, they they pretty much do you know almost all clinical work. Uh, that's you're still considered an academic uh, you know medicine in, in academic medicine. Then there's the the uh, the next field that sort of has a 25 percent so about uh, you know 25 percent or so cl uh, research requirement and then 75 percent clinical. That's kind of a hybrid, and at the different UCs, it's, it, it can be called uh, different terms, but uh, oftentimes it can be called um, clinical X series. And then there's the flip side where it's sort of the the um, uh, tenure track series, where it's uh, you know more than 25 uh, percent. Uh, it's more like 50 to 75 percent research, and only about uh, 25 to 50 percent clinical work. So that's the most rigorous uh, that that we need. Uh, for, for that rigorous research requirement. So there's different tracks of, of getting involved in academic uh, medicine, depending on how much teaching or research or clinical work one needs. So it really boils down to what they want to do the most. Do they want to see patients uh, uh, the vast majority of the time? Do they want to do research the vast majority of the time or teach or, or, or a hybrid? But there are opportunities for all of those. And I do believe with coronavirus, that uh, t these opportunities are going to become immense. So, for example, now I do my, my teaching sessions for uh, my, uh, our, my you know, our students, medical students, or residents. We're doing it all by Zoom, you know, by you know, uh, online. And now I can bring in, in my colleagues from somewhere else instantly. Now they don't have to drive to, to you know, to, to be a, 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 an invited speaker. So it actually brings more opportunity for people. And I, and I think one of the, somebody had a question of this sort. I, I think that this is a very good time to get into healthcare. We, this, is, this is the time when we have to all work together to make the world a better place to live in. And, and, and I think this, this is the time to do it. You did. Okay. Thank you, Yama. Um, this is a question for all of you. So whoever wants to jump in. Um, many attendees have been asking about balancing the cost of graduate training in healthcare and medicine and how this dictates career decision making. Any thoughts or advice on how you've navigated this in your own lives? I will actually jump in first. Um, I will let you know that uh, one of the main reasons I went to graduate school is because of the endowment uh, that Betty Irene Moore uh, Gordon gave to UC Davis specifically to encourage nurses to go into higher education um, and assume faculty roles in leadership. Uh, so I, my tuition was covered for grad school as a part of that endowment because I decided to select um, a program that was funded. And um, so I, I would encourage you to uh, align the things that you're interested in doing and looking for um, organizations or programs that um, incentivize people to go into those areas um, to provide um, funds for that, especially for nurses. I know the National Black Nurses Association gives scholarships, the ANA 
the Association of California Nurse the Leaders. There's lots of um, support out there. You just have to really uh, look for it. So that, that goes back to being connected to professionals in the arena that uh, you plan to work because their support at varying levels. So I would strongly suggest looking for those types of opportunities. I do think COVID is going to present um, and shine a light on our public health needs. And we always need more public health and rural health professionals. So I think there's gonna be an opportunity to uh, grow in those areas. Great, anybody else wanna jump in here? Our neurosurgical physician. I just, uh, just to add to that, I think that um, it kind of goes back to one of, one of the things I was emphasizing earlier which supports what uh, Sheree is mentioning. I think the opportunities are there. If somebody loves something that, you know, some, I think they should pursue it. The finances oftentimes will balance each other out. So for example, in my case, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I loved so many things and I ended up pursuing an MD PhD program. Um, and I knew it was gonna take a lot longer and I was, uh, it was tough trying to support my, my parents at the same time. But I ended up having all my tuition covered because of an NIH grant for what's called the Medical Scientist Training Program for, for all my medical school. And so um, that, that really enabled me to pursue academic medicine later on. And so the opportunities oftentimes will be there. If you have the passion, I, I don't, that's, this is just my opinion, I don't think that you know, the finances should, should, should stop you completely because probably your passion is going to be so great that you're going to make some, you know, you're going to become very successful and find a way to, to cover expenses. That, that's what I believe. Great. Um, here's a question for all of us, including me, apparently. How do you find career supporters, mentors, or colleagues who will support you through your career? And I'm curious to hear from the people in particular who have decided to be mentors. I will just say that one of the best pieces of advice that my mother gave me was that you need to be nice to everyone, right? So, And you don't burn bridges. So I am nice to everyone I meet everybody I work with, police and security, the front desk staff, the people that clean up after us. I just, and I try to be a real team player. Like I'm, I'm not above, you know, dipping urines or changing beds or sheets or whatever, whatever needs to be done. Um, and it has served me well. And I don't know if it directly answers the question, but I know it's put me in a position where I have never felt awkward or uncomfortable asking someone for a recommendation or a referral or, or some advice because you know, I just always try to treat people with kindness. What about the people who are the mentors? How, how can people find mentors like you? Um, I would suggest, um, well, the, the whole idea of a lifelong mentor, I think that happens organically. Um, I think you have to get comfortable with the idea that you may have different mentors in different arenas. Like I definitely have mentors inside and outside of healthcare. Um, one of my favorite mentors that I actually met while working at uh, UC Davis before, um, like early on in my career, was actually one of the janitors. Uh, someone had um, gone down outside and he initiated CPR to get help. This was just like on the sidewalk and I got to know him and talk to him and I still speak to him to this day. Um, so I would say identify people. You'll have mentors for different reasons. And then I go back to the importance of professional affiliation and networking, because you'll, you'll organically find some of these people in your life, and then just invite them out um, to coffee or a meeting or even an email conversation if they're very busy, um, just to kind of dig in to get some insight and, and work on it there. Like sometimes you think that someone's a great mentor and you don't click. So you kind of have to get out there and go after it. And, um, and every person you meet is a potential um, mentor. So all you have to do is ask, and if they have the time, they'll make it. And if that's not the opportunity, you can find um, another person. But it, it's as literally as uh, simple as an ask. And sometimes you're being mentored and you don't even know it. You don't even have a formal mentorship relationship with someone. I mean, the whole reason I'm in television was because I befriended a nurse whose husband happened to work for the Boston Globe who knew the news director at the station, passed my name mm -hmm. along. So, you know, little did I know that she was actually working behind the scenes advocating for me. So be nice to everyone. Did anybody else? We have a couple more questions and we are running out of time. Did anyone want to jump in on this question or should I move on? No. Okay. Um, let's see. For all the panelists, this is from Ruth. 
She says, I would like to grow my career, but have found ageism in the workplace to be a serious hindrance. Can you offer any advice for addressing this? This has got to be a popular question. Which is why it's a popular question, because nobody has easy answers. <laughs> I, you know, I, I always see the, the opposite, actually, um, because I am very young, but I have worked for 15 years of my career in healthcare, um, but I started very early. Um, and so I see it the, the other way. I'm on the, the other side. I, I, in fact, I'm not old enough to be a protected class yet as far as ages. <laughs> so I'm, I'm on the other side of it. Um, but, but I think your, um, your dedication and talent and um, all those things really can help you persevere in those situations because it's like the proof is in the pudding at the end of the day you just have to be the change you want to see in those situations I would say but go ahead I, I, cut I guess off. I was just assuming that Ruth is asking for people who are older but she just says hey, right maybe she's talking about younger people who feel like they aren't taken seriously I don't know for sure but I have to say as someone who works in television and someone who works in healthcare, I see a lot less ageism in healthcare than I do in television, which is such a subjective uh, business. And, you know, as we age, we tend to be moved out to pasture. Um, does anybody else have any advice on someone who's trying to build their career and might feel that they're too old or too young or not getting the respect they deserve? I was just going to say, you know, um, I have to uh, hire people for my research lab all the time. And then, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the clinical setting, I work with all different ages. But I think if and when that happens, I would recommend just, you know, uh, privately when sitting, just organize a, a list of, uh, of, of items that you think, why, why you, you know, somebody may think that they, they're facing ageism um, and what, what the pros and cons may be of a person at that either young age or, or, or you know, mm -hmm. uh, older age, because th th there are a lot of advantages and benefits that come with both of, of those mm -hmm. uh, ends. And then compensate. So, for for example, uh, just give one one example. If if uh, somebody looks at somebody older as may maybe being a little bit um, out of touch with the technology, maybe uh, refresher courses may, may be helpful and putting that on your resume. Likewise, with younger people, when I when I'm interviewing younger people, and, and I, I also I should say I'm. I've been on the admissions committee for the medical for the UCI medical scientist training program, and there was a question I think on the chat about admissions. This goes for 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 that as well. When we're interviewing people, right, we have younger people and older people, and they both there's advantages that come to to both. And I think it's important to consider what those are, and then compensate for those. To take build the resume, build the CV. So for a younger person, if I think that they may lack experience in some capacity. I, I would want to see that in their CV. So, so, so there's a, there are a lot of ways to train. And I think that with the coronavirus, uh, online training is going to get huge. It's going to get huge. And so it, 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 you can do this from your home probably at nights. You're working on training yourself and building your resume, resume a couple hours in the evening. Uh, so I, I think just sitting down and thinking about those, those positives and negatives and compensating would, would probably be helpful. I have to say, at least in my experience, um, I just had the, the greatest wealth of knowledge is in the older nurses that I work with and the older physicians that I work with. I love them so much. And I'm always so sad when one retires because I've been at our place for 20 years. So I've seen some retire and I'm like, no, we need you. Um, so I'm sorry if someone's having that experience. That's a real shame, especially in healthcare because experience goes a long way. You know, there's book knowledge, but then, you know, I've seen patients for 50 years, that, that's, that's very important. Okay, let's see, I think we have time for one more question. This is for everyone, it's from Mark, who says, how effective are your organizations at leadership succession? Are there formal programs within that create and develop future leaders internally? I'll just say the little bit that, um, that I'm familiar with at Kaiser. First of all, we have a fellowship program which introduces uh, people to different roles. Um, so you may become a department administrator, you'll work at region. This is an application process. And the nice thing about it is that you rotate through a number of departments and positions in order to identify, number one, where your talents and interests lie, um, but also where the need is. I encourage anyone who is in charge of, um, of hiring to really consider that type of rotation. There are many industries for whom 
Um, this is normal. Consulting, right, uh, is often they rotate you through different roles within an organization. Um, and I think that we could definitely do that a better job within healthcare. Um, and then the other piece is it's all of our responsibilities to build that pipeline. So in my current position, there wasn't an internship program. We just had uh, this past uh, academic year, we just had our eighth intern finish their, their capstone and I'm looking to onboard more. So that didn't exist, that was informal. Um, you know, if you're at a UC, if you're at a Kaiser, if you're at a, a big organization, they're going to be very competitive to get into. So how can we help build that pipeline for the folks that maybe missed the cutoff or weren't, you know, weren't right for that fellowship program? It, it really is all of our responsibility. Anybody else wanna jump in on that? Not so much. I have to say um, in terms of just grabbing the bull by the horns or whatever the expression is, I work with a, a woman who's a co-director of our urgent care and she's, she's just wonderful and she has natural leadership abilities. And so um, she said, I just rounded with the ICU team at Mass General and this is what they're doing with the COVID patients in terms of flipping them over on their ventilators. And I'm like, what do you mean you rounded with the ICU team? Like, well, how'd you do that? She's like, I asked. Then she was like, I was down in the emergency room at Mass General and this is what they're doing with their COVID. And I'm like, how did you get to do that? She said, I just asked. So I think a lot of times you just have to ask, right? Um, I think that should be just a general theme for a lot of the questions that we're, we're getting, but uh, yes, just ask and be tenacious and uh, follow through. Let's see, what time is it? It is, we have like two more minutes. Cherie, are you up for one more? There was one directed directly to you. Sure. From Amar, who says, what advice do you have for someone who wants to pivot careers from operations administration into medicine nursing? What steps should one take? And you have, a, you have about a minute and a half. Really quick. So this is excellent. Actually, some of my favorite people in nursing um, are nurses as a second career, and they bring such a new and different perspective. Um, one of my close friends um, was a, uh, into biochemistry, and she switched over into nursing as a second career. So I would say um, when you look at all of those skill sets, nursing is so diverse. You can do like anything from the bedside to the boardroom to research. Um, and so taking those skills that you already have and the things that you like to do and applying them in the areas that um, you like to do, like, a, like for instance, I prefer being in ambulatory care or surgical specialties, um, but there's, there's just so much to do. So I would say, look at your strengths that you have and what you like, um, and then match that against the criteria, the mission and vision of the different programs and see if you can marry the two. One of the reasons I love Betty Irene Moore at UC Davis as well, because I, the things that I care about most, they are also really caring about there, about health inequity and um, non-traditional modalities for providing care in the community. So I was very passionate about that. So choosing that program was very easy in that respect. So just doing some research and seeing what's out there and who aligns with how you think and feel and then applying yourself. But I think it's excellent to bring different types of experience into medicine. Um, that's the innovation that we need to um, move the needle forward. Well, thank you. And I'd like to say thank you on behalf of the University of California for joining us today for this UC Alumni Career Network webinar. It was a pleasure to connect virtually with each of you today and we appreciate your taking the time out of your day to gain some valuable advice and help advance your career. I want to thank Yama and Cherie and Leah for their time, generosity, and commitment to UFC. The insights and advice you each shared today make me especially proud to be part of the UC community. I hope you'll take a few minutes out there to provide some feedback on today's event by following the survey gizmo link, which will appear on your screen when the webinar ends. Your feedback is useful to help us determine future topics. We hope to see you again for a future UC Alumni Career Network webinar. Please visit ucal.us slash ACN for further details on upcoming episodes. I want to thank you again for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Please stay safe out there. And I am going to go do some meditation. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>